This video illustrates how to draw a flow net. The shape of the system shown here is similar to a plastic model that we show in another ebook video. It represents a concrete dam with an upper level and a lower level reservoir. The plastic model has a wall on this side, a wall on the bottom, and a wall on this side. And we will compare our flow lines to the flow lines of that model. So we've drawn a similar shape here. The white area represents homogeneous soil. And the black area represents a dam. The dam is wider at the base and has a cutoff wall, not only to provide some stability, but also to make the path of flow longer for groundwater moving from the upper to the lower level reservoir. To draw a flow net, we start by defining the boundaries. And this side is then an impermeable barrier. And the bottom is an impermeable barrier. And the wall on the right is an impermeable barrier. And with a flow net, we draw everything to scale. It doesn't matter how large it is, as long as everything is expanded or reduced to the same scale. We have to have a datum for the flow net. And for this, we will use the base of the system. And this reservoir on the up gradient side is at 11 meters elevation. And the one at the down gradient side is at 6 meters elevation. We can define the boundary at the base of the reservoir as being an 11 meter equal potential line. We know that if the surface of a water body is 11 meters, then the head at any depth in the water body is also 11 meters. And so the equal potential line on this side is 6 meters. We know that there will be a drop of water that will theoretically follow the wall around the system and follow the inside wall of the dam around the system. There may be a bit of stagnation in the corners. And our objective would be to draw the central flow lines. So it's good to start just with your intuition of where do you think water will move through the system. Don't worry about getting it right at first because the process of drawing a flow net is a process of drawing and erasing and drawing and erasing until you have a flow net that is acceptable. So I've drawn a couple flow lines. This would represent three flow tubes. There would be water flowing here, here, here. And in a flow net drawing, each flow tube is to represent the same amount of water flowing. We get that by drawing our equal potential lines in and making them at right angles to no flow boundaries, right angles to the flow lines, and forming squares between the equal potential lines and the flow lines. If I attempt to put in my first equal potential line here, I can see right away that I'm not getting squares in that area. So I would conclude that I probably have to move this flow line in somewhat. Maybe, and it must meet the equal potential line in right angles. Uh, and this equal potential line at right angles, so this one might move in a bit. We can judge whether a shape is square if we can roughly sketch a circle inside it. If it looks more like an oval, then it's not square. And I should say these are curvilinear squares. And in fact, a flow net does not have to have squares formed. We only need to make the same length to width ratio. It's just difficult to judge with the human eye a given ratio, but it's fairly easy to judge whether you have a square. So we work with the squares. Let me continue to put equal potential lines in here. And a lot of times, once you get the general idea of which way flow is going, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and put in some equal potential lines and not worry too much about how they look. Get them in there and then stop, sit back, ask yourself if you've formed squares. And you can see I'm clearly not forming squares uh, at this point. Some of you will be better at drawing 
very quickly, the squares, but I like to make it so that you can see how it might look and how you might need to make adjustments. So clearly these shapes are very long in this way and in this flow tube, they're very long in this way. So this flow line needs to move up in the system, perhaps somewhere up in this area. So I'll reach this lower flow line. And this is oblong and this is tall, so maybe this flow line needs to move down. Something more like that. It may, it may rise a little bit in there. And then I might say we often get sort of a stagnation zone and so we're looking at corners. We don't get squares quite as well. Although this all might move over just a little bit in here, including this one. And move this up a bit. And this up a bit. Remember, we're trying to always meet our no-flow boundaries at right angles. We're trying to meet our flow lines at right angles. Now, this is quite oblong. Let me um, add an extra equal potential line here that we didn't put in before. And in an attempt to make these more square, I'm going to add something in here. Mm. I may have, let's see. Just more flow, more equal potential lines than I need over here. <clears throat> Just bring this down considerably to try to make a square out of this. Sometimes my old lines may distract us. <clears throat> bad shape here I could keep adjusting to make the squares better and better but in order to reduce the time for us to be watching this video I'm going to quit at this point I think the important thing is to notice that would an additional equal potential line or one less equal potential line give us more square shapes. And I don't think that's the case. I think the case here at this point is that if we adjusted the lines a little bit, we might get a little bit more square in some places and a little bit less um, oblong in other places. The next step would be to label the equal potential lines. We know that we have 11 meters at this location and 6 meters at this location, so we have a total head drop across the system of 5 meters. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 head drops. So a head drop is uh, a difference in head between one equal potential line and another equal potential line. So with 11 head drops, if we have a five meter overall head drop, we divide by 11, so we get 0 0.4545 meters uh, between each one of the equal potential lines. 
So this first equal potential line would be labeled 10.55. And let me just skip and label every other equal potential line. So they're basically approximately 0.9 apart. And then six here. And so when you put your increments in, you should come back out to the proper head at the lower side of the dam. Next, let's calculate the amount of water flowing below the dam. You may recall from the text that the formula for doing this is equal to the hydraulic conductivity of the soil, the total head drop across the system, the number of flow tubes, in this case we have one, two, three flow tubes, the number of head drops, we counted those as 11, and then the width of the system into the paper. So if, for example, the hydraulic conductivity were, say, two meters per day, the total head drop we know is five meters, the number of flow tubes is three, the number of head drops is 11, and let's say that it goes into the diagram 40 meters. We can see here that we have meters cubed per day, so that's a discharge rate. That's what we were expecting. It's a good check. We carry through the calculation. We get 109 cubic meters per day. If we wanted to know the head at any location in the system, we could pick a point. Let's say we pick this point. We'd estimate that this is about one quarter of the way between these two equal potential lines. We know that the total head drop between equal potential lines is four, five, four, five meters. Dividing by four, we'll say that's about 0.1. So the head at this location would be 0.11 meters less than 11 meters. So that would be 10.89. This is the system that we drew the flow net for. Notice the similarity of the lines indicated by the die and the lines drawn in the flow net. 